Okay, I'm back. Let's pick up where we left off in the second part of this video series on the status of morality. And we ended by thinking about some of the problems that Schaefer Landau identifies for ethical relativism. If you're reading The Fundamentals of Ethics, okay, this is in chapter 19, and he begins to uh, examine the problems in on starting on page 318. Okay, so these are some of the problems that he identifies for the ethical relativist. That goes from page 318, uh, and you can look at the the subheadings, right, or the the topical headings: moral infallibility, moral equivalence, questioning our own commitments, moral progress, the problem of contradiction. These are all the different um, problems that, that, that Schaefer Landau thinks the ethical relativist faces. And they're objections to the view. And to defend ethical relativism would mean showing why the objection fails or resolving the problem that is raised. If you can't re reply to the objection and show the mistake that's there in the objection, or if you can't resolve the problem, then you don't have a way of defending ethical relativism anymore, from which it follows that you should give it up. It's not a view that you can defend. You shouldn't believe it. Right? That's the kind of philosophical move that's being made in Chapter 19. Let's look at the slide. Oops, once again, I'm having trouble making myself go away. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, OK, oh, there we go. OK, I'm going to go down to the bottom and present the slide. Notice that these problems are ones that both Midgley and Enoch and Gensler all address in one way or another. So all of the readings for this week, Midgley, Enoch, and Gensler for last week, right? these are all examples of philosophers who are arguing against ethical relativism. Hume is the one philosopher we read last week who defends a kind of relativism. But here are some of the problems that Midgley and Enoch and Gensler, in different ways, um, address. So first, one problem with relativism is that it seems to make individuals or societies morally infallible. If the measure of the rightness of an action is my attitude toward it, right, whether I approve of it or not, right, that's pure subjectivism, then that suggests that I can never really be wrong about my judgments. right? If I believe something is wrong, then it is wrong for me. If I approve of an action, then it is right for me. I can never make mistakes. That seems like a problem, right? Morality seems to be objective enough that it's really possible for us to make mistakes as individuals. To think that something is okay and to discover that we've done something wrong. Um, or think about societies. It also makes societies and their cultural norms morally infallible. So if what makes um, it morally acceptable to defend the rights of women is that our society approves of it, well, <clears throat> that suggests that a society that doesn't approve of it, right, um, knows infallibly that it's, it's okay to violate the rights of women because it's not something that um, that society disapproves of. But again, this is a problem. It suggests that um, societies can't be wrong in their collective judgments about right and wrong. They can, um, and we want to say that there is a basis within a culture, within a society, for criticizing its moral judgments. Right? Sometimes societies make mistakes. The relativist can't seem to explain that. <clears throat> uh, it also eliminates the basis for moral disagreement. The subjectivist view is that everyone's moral judgment is just as plausible as, as everyone else's. And, and so then there's no real basis for disagreeing. When I say that it's OK to lie and you say it's not, we're not really disagreeing about anything. We're just expressing different attitudes. Or when we say that um, that it's you know in you know in one culture it's okay to violate the rights of women, but in another culture it's not. There's not really a disagreement there. We're just describing two different codes, and every code is equally good. 
and everyone's opinion is equally plausible. That's either a form of subjectivism or cultural relativism. And on both views, there's no real basis for disagreeing about anything. We don't really disagree about anything. We just have different attitudes. But the question, is it okay to lie? There's no answer to that question, right? As we're not really disagreeing about that. We're, quite, we're disagreeing about our attitudes toward the act of lying. Similarly, is it okay to violate the rights of women? Well, on the relativist view, there's no answer to that question. And when we look at different cultures, right, that have different attitudes toward that question um, or that practice or, the, or that value rights in different ways, right, they're not really disagreeing about anything. They're just expressing different customs or they're embodying different customs. Okay. That seems like a problem because it seems like we want to say that there is a base, there, there are legitimate disagreements about morality and the relativists can't really explain them. Um, so related to both of these, there's no room within the relativist position to question your own basic commitments. Why? You know, if, if, if I approve of, of uh, from a subjectivist point of view, if it, if it, what makes uh, lying okay is that I approve of it, <clears throat> well, what could possibly get me to question that commitment? Um, if the standard of right and wrong is contained within me, right? Um, or if the standard of right and wrong is contained within the guiding ideals or codes of my, of my society, if there's no higher standard to appeal to, right, then on what basis does a society question its basic commitments? But look, we know that individuals sometimes do question their basic commitments, right? Am I doing the right thing? And societies reflect upon and question their guiding ideals, right? So the ethical relativists can't explain how that's possible, how they do that. Um, another way of putting that is there's no such thing as moral progress, according to the relativist. So when a, when a society um, expands the rights of women, there's no way of arguing that that society is better off than it was before. It's just different. Now the society has different attitudes toward the rights of women than it did 50 years ago. But the relativist can't explain that as a form of progress. It's just it's, something changed, but it didn't get better or worse because every code is equally good, or every attitude is equally good, or equally plausible. Um, societies don't get better from a moral perspective, right? Uh, individuals don't make moral progress. They just, their attitudes change. <clears throat> um, and I, we talked last time about the problem of contradiction. We can come back to that. So Midgley is someone who focuses there, right? Midgley really focuses, among other things, on the, 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 the claim that ethical relativism eliminates the basis for moral disagreement and it leads to a kind of problem of contradiction or incoherence. It also doesn't leave any room for questioning one's own basic commitments or for questioning the guiding ideals or code of one's society. Right? All of these, many of these problems here in this, in this bullet point slide are ones that Midgley brings up. Here she is. She recently died. She was a philosopher at Newcastle in, in England. She's known for her work on science, ethics, animal rights. There she is in her library. Um, her essay, Trying Out One's New Sword, is what we read. And I'm going to move a little more quickly here. She has a central example. Right? The question is, do we ever have a basis for forming a moral opinion about practices in other cultures that we don't, um, you know, that, that seem to express values that we don't share or practices that we don't immediately understand? Um, do, we, do we ever have a basis from the point of view of one culture for forming a moral opinion or making a judgment about the practices of another culture? Uh, the relativists would say no, right? There is no cross-cultural moral standard or objective moral standard that we can appeal to in judging another culture. We can only appeal to standards from within our own culture, not right to judge to judge what we're doing we can't use our moral standards and apply them to another culture right that's the relativist position so she takes an example of the samurai it's a it's a it's a, a practice that has gone out of fashion but i don't know precisely when it went out of fashion we go to page 197 she describes the practice right um so the samurai were warriors who used swords right to defend towns, right? They were, they were swordsmen. And in order to know that they could do a, a, the, the job of the samurai, they needed to know that their sword was sharp enough, right? So a samurai sword had to be tried out because if it was to work properly, it had to slice through someone at a single blow, 
Otherwise, the warrior bungled his stroke. This could injure his honor, offend his ancestors, even let down his emperor. So tests were needed, and wayfarers, wayfarers had to be expended. Any wayfarer would do, provided, of course, that he was not another samurai. So the idea here, the practice is that a samurai got to test out his new sword on just an innocent bystander, wayfarer, walking through town to make sure that it worked properly. This was a permitted practice. It was morally acceptable within the medieval uh, towns in, in Japan at the time. I don't know when the practice ended, but at some point it, it no longer was acceptable. Um, so here's a practice. From our perspective, it looks wrong, right? Um, the samurai, no matter how much honor and prestige he has within his community, no, no matter how important the job of the samurai is, nobody should be able to use an innocent bystander to test their tools, if that means um, slicing the, the innocent bystander into pieces. Okay, that does not, it's not a way of respecting the, the life of the innocent bystander, right? Um, it, 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 it violates our, 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 many of our ideals about human rights and the way we value human life, right, from, from our perspective. Okay, so the question is whether we have a basis for saying that the samurai practice of trying out your new sword is wrong. Is there an argument to be made? And do we, as non, you know, uh, 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 do we from the outside have the authority to make that argument? Or is the criticism of the practice one that can only be made within the context of medieval Japanese society or from within the context of Japanese culture? Um, so there, the, the, the position that she is uh, attacking in her essay is called moral isolationism. And it's the view that we have no basis, no legitimate basis for or no legitimate authority for making moral judgments about other cultures and their practices. Um, she points out that when she wrote this, which is a while ago, uh, I think she published this in the in the 80s, but maybe maybe before that, when she wrote this, this was a, a relatively popular view, a way of defending, going back here, um, a way of defending the, the, the value of tolerance and the idea that we should accept and, 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 and respect cultural difference. This is what sort of motivated moral isolationism. Um, but she criticizes the view. Right? She argues that moral isolationism is incoherent. So think about this as you read. What are her objections? Do you agree with her reasoning? What conclusion does she draw? Um, she thinks that moral isolationism leads to a logical difficulty. It contradicts itself. It leads to the conclusion, among other things, that we cannot engage in moral reasoning about ourselves, about, about our own culture. That if we don't have the, any basis for judging the practices of another culture, she thinks it follows that we don't really have any basis for judging the practices of our own. But So moral reasoning, in the end, has no basis at all. That's a form of nihilism, right? There is no objective moral truth. Uh, there, isn't, there are no moral truths at all, right? Um, there are just relations of power. And moral reasoning doesn't really amount to anything. We have no basis for making moral judgments of any kind. Right? She thinks that's incoherent, a kind of contradiction. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, So ultimately, she thinks if we're committed to toleration and we're committed to respecting cultural difference, we have to engage in moral debate. We have to be able to uh, express our moral opinions and engage in argument and get closer to whatever truths there are about our various practices. So that means both looking at ourselves and questioning our own commitments, but also the, 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 the capacity to look at other cultures and question their commitments and their practices. Those kinds of debates are part of what it means to progress as human beings, right? And she thinks that moral isolationism rules out the possibility of real moral progress, right? Um, okay, so that's Midgley. I'm running out of time. The last two slides look at uh, Enoch and his, his question about, about the tests for objectivity. He's trying to defend an objectivist approach to morality. He thinks morality is objective and he contrasts it with our taste in food and music and our taste in fashion. Those are more subjective matters, but morality is more objective than our taste in food and music. Think, if, think about whether you agree with him or not. Um, that's all for now. I'm going to end there and I'll see you later this week. Okay, bye.